The title today is Waiting on God. So if you have your Bibles open, let's read it together. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 2, verse 1. And it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. And David said, Where should I go up? And the Lord said, To Hebron. And David went up there with his two wives, Ahinam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal uh, the Carmelite. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man of his household. And so they dwelt in the city of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came there and anointed David king over the house of Judah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we pray that you would give us ears to hear what you would speak to us as we study the life of David, Lord, and and how waiting is a part of the process. And we pray that you would just continue your work in our lives here this morning, that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we're studying the life of David, uh, David comes to a new chapter in his life. And uh, if you've been here with us on, uh, you know, through 1 Samuel, that, you know, David's had a lot of difficulty. And he's been waiting 15 years to get to this point where he's at here in 2 Samuel. And as it says in verse 1, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord. Now, uh, when it says it happened after this, if you haven't been here for the last six months studying with us, you're like, after what? What, uh, what happened after? Well, Samuel was, uh, had anointed David to be king of Israel, and Saul, who was the current king, was envious of David, hunted him, tried to kill him for 15 years, 13 to 15 years. David's been on the run, living in caves uh, for around 15 years. And those years, those 15 years of difficulty were a chapter in David's life. And God was using that time to shape him and mold him. But I think it's important to understand that God was preparing David for where we're at now. When we get to 2 Samuel 2, uh, this is a new chapter in his life. And, and I love to look at life uh, as a whole and to think about your life as chapters. Because every one of us has different chapters of life, right? When you were in junior high, that's a chapter of life uh, where you look every day and see if you have pimples. I mean, and then, uh, you know, when you get to high school, you know, different chapter, college or young adult or young single adult or, you know, every chapter of life is different and it's very different, right? And then, uh, and so when you think about David's life, there was a lot of difficulty in the previous chapters and, you know, but God used that for good. And I think all of us need to be consciously aware that David was a man after God's own heart. God loved David. David loved God. David went through through some trials, but God used those things to shape him because he's going to become the greatest king in the history of Israel, and God worked through those difficult chapters to make him become the person that he wanted him to be. Now, by the time we get done with 2 Samuel, you're going to forget all about those early chapters of David's life. You, you won't be thinking about, you'll be thinking about all the great things he's done. And when you think about it, most people, if you were to ask them who's not studying the life of David, what do you know about David? Oh, he killed Goliath. What else? He was a king. What else? Uh, he had a girl named Bathsheba. I mean, I mean, it's like, you know, but they don't typically remember his hiding in the caves. And so when it says in verse 1, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord. I mean, this also is referring to what we just read a few weeks ago where David moved all of his men and his family and, their men and their, his men and their families to this town called Ziglag, which was in the enemy's territory, and to try to hide from King Saul. And David and his army were out, and while he was gone, some Amalekites came and raided the town of Ziklag and took all of David's men's families and David's family, took them captive, burned the city to the ground. <clears throat> and remember, if you were here last week, David encouraged himself. And how did he do that? By seeking the Lord for direction, what to do. And God supernaturally helped David get all of his family back, all his possessions back. And and, and God worked through all that to, uh, and that must have been probably one of the lowest points in David's life, where he had lost everything. His men wanted to kill him. Now, after all of that, David is still in Ziglag. Now, he doesn't know what has happened in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. And so here in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 2, It says, and it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And David said to him, how did how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, the people have fled from battle and many of the people have fallen dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. In verse five. So David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? As it uh, happened by chance. 
uh, to be, uh, I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear. And indeed, uh, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, uh, he saw me and called me, and I answered, here I am. And so standing uh, over me, uh, please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and I killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown uh, that was on his head and the bracelet was on his arm, and I have brought them here to my Lord. Now, this guy's telling David what happened with Saul. And he doesn't, David doesn't know. And this guy tells David basically, hey, I saw Saul. He was injured, and he was going to die. And so he told me to kill him, so I did. And I think this guy thinks that David is like some of us. Now, what if someone came to you and said, the guy who was trying to kill you for 15 years is now dead? You want a piece of pie? I mean, I don't know what you would say to him, but uh, this man thinks that David is going to give him a reward. But David doesn't do that, right? Because David is a man after God's own heart. And in 2 Samuel 1.11, it says, Then David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. Now, that was a, a, a symbol of, of you know, mourning and remorse, that David was sad that Saul and Jonathan were dead. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord, and for the house of the Lord, because they had fallen by the sword. So David was sad because Saul and Jonathan were dead and God's people were being killed, and he was sad about that. Now, it also shows us that there was no bitterness in David's heart. David didn't say, let's have a party. Saul's dead, let's celebrate. And I think also important for us to note, as this new chapter that comes into David's life, he doesn't sit around and reminisce all the bad things that happened in the previous chapters. He doesn't talk about all the bad things Saul did. He, he just focuses on what's happening right now. And uh, you know, David had learned through those 15 years of hiding in caves that his security didn't come from, you know, military might or living in a palace or the city with walls. He'd learned all those things because he was living in a city with walls and it got destroyed, right? He learned and he realized that his security and his peace comes from being in the presence of the Lord. Now, I love that because it's a lesson that all of us need to know, especially as, you know, we're going through, you know, a time in our country where Things are crazier than ever, and we need to know that our trust and hope needs to be in the Lord. And that's what David understands, and David wrote about it quite often. In the Psalms, in Psalm 61, David wrote, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy, and I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. So, so David said, look, when I'm overwhelmed, then I, I, I come to the Lord, and I spend time with God. And that's important for all of us. If you put your hope in politicians or educators or whatever it is that people put their hope in, uh, doctors, whatever it might be, that, that you're going to be disappointed. And, and David understood that God is the only place where you can come for true peace, no matter what's going on in the world. And so it says in verse 1, it happened after this. And so this is a new chapter in David's life. At this point, Saul is dead. Now, you just think about what's going on here. Saul's dead. David has already been anointed king by Samuel 15 years ago, and there's nothing stopping David from going and taking the throne of Israel. And, you know, you think about it, this is what David's been waiting for. And David wrote about it in Psalm 37, 34, where he said, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. Now, notice David, David said in Psalm 37, wait on the Lord. Now, this is something that is a characteristic in David's life that we want to learn because David is held up for us as a model of a person. He, it says that he's a man after God's own heart. David waited on the Lord, and that was part of the way that he lived life. It was the way he rolled. Now, in this new chapter in David's life, the, the opportunities are endless. Uh, Saul's gone. His men are probably telling him, hey, David, man, this is your blessed day because Saul's dead. Let's go back to Israel and let's take over and you'll be in charge. You'll be the king and we'll be your army. And man, this is an awesome day. Let's go. Now, what does David do though? Does David just get up and say, you're right. I am awesome and let's go. <laughs> People are going to sing songs about me. No, that's not what he does. The first thing that David does in this next chapter of his life is the same thing that all of us should do when we move to a new chapter in life. Whether you're going from junior high to high school, to college, to if you're getting married, you need to double down on this, what David does. But uh, 
And if you're having kids, triple. But anyway, he says in verse 1, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord. The first thing David does in this next chapter of his life is he inquires of the Lord. David had learned during the previous chapter of his life, those 15 years of waiting, that no matter what the circumstance looked like, there's no reason to rush. That the first step in accomplishing God's purposes is to inquire of the Lord, to pray and say, Lord, what do you want us to do? And, you know, we live in a society where people are always trying to push us into making snap decisions. Hey, if you don't buy this car, it won't be here tomorrow. I mean, that might be true now. But, I mean, uh, th- that because there's a shortage of everything, workers, cars, food, everything. But, uh, but David doesn't rush into anything. He, he is a person who always seeks God first. And even though it's obvious to everyone else, David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. We know it. You've been anointed by Samuel, uh, and Saul's gone. And so that's just that. But David doesn't assume anything. And I think this is another lesson that we can learn about David is that he doesn't assume anything. And and as we are going to study David's life, you know, David's going to get into battles where it seems very obvious that if I do this, I'll win the battle. But he doesn't assume anything. He prays. He seeks God. And sometimes God says, no, don't do what seems obvious. Don't do what everybody else says. You need to do this. And, And that's why we all know David's name, because he sought the Lord first in every stage, in every chapter of life. And You know, for David, it looks like he won the lottery. And, and, you know, all of you have thought about that. What if I win the lottery? What am I going to do? Buy a Ferrari, uh, buy an electric car, I don't know, buy a new house. Uh, David, everything, all of his troubles were Saul, and he's gone. And what does David do? The very first thing, he doesn't jump to conclusions. He doesn't listen to the voices around him. The first thing he does, it says in verse 1, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord saying, and so he prayed and said, shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? So David is saying, God, what should I do? Where should I go? Should I go to any of these cities? Uh, I know that you've known him as king, but but how's that going to work out? How do you want to do that? And it's almost as if David has the same heart as Moses did. Remember when God said, I'm going to take you and bring you to the promised land? And and Moses said, God, if you don't go with me, I don't want to go, right? Even though Moses is in all kinds of things, And I think David has that same heart, like, God, I don't want to go anywhere unless you're leading, unless you're directing. And so David says there, shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? I mean, he doesn't just assume anything. He prays and says, God, what do you want to do? And so God tells him uh, in verse 1, it says, David inquired of the Lord and said, shall I go up to any of the cities? And the Lord said to him, go up. So God says, okay, David, go. And then David said, where? Where shall I go? And he said, to Hebron. Now, I love this because as you're going to learn about David's life, that not only does the first thing that David does as the way he rolls in life is to pray and seek God in every chapter, every phase, and even every step, but he also is specific. David specifically prays, which city should I go to? And, you know, sometimes people think, well, does God really care what city David went to? Absolutely. Here's the thing. God knows the future. He knows everything about your life. He knows everything about what's coming in the future. And so if you say, God, should I go here or go there? Does he care? Absolutely he does. Now, I've heard people say, well, God doesn't care. Just do whatever. I'm like, well, he knows every hair on my head, but he doesn't care whether I buy a house that's going to be a bad investment? I don't think so. I think he cares about every choice we make. And I believe as we are, you know, racing towards a you know, the end of the world, I believe we're in the last days, as we are racing towards a one-world government, you know, there's just global crisis after global crisis. So if you flip on, you know, your news app on your phone or whatever, and I mean, it's just one crisis after another, right? It's, oh, no, it's global warming, we're all going to die, or a global pandemic, or global war, or I just, you know, I'm flipping through it this morning, and it's like, oh, now it's a global food so- shortage. So because of what's going on in Ukraine, we have $8 gas, and now there's no more food because of what's happening in Ukraine. Now, I don't believe that, but that's what you read. And, and, and I believe that, you know, our world just wants you to be filled with angst and worry and fear. Oh, no, uh, you know, the sky is falling. And, and I do believe that that is just part of what the world does to manipulate people. But here's the thing. We need to recognize that as we live in a crazy world, we do not want to make decisions based on lies that people tell you, right? And, and so if, if you live your life based on social media, Facebook, Instagram, network news, whatever it is, there are a lot of lies in there. Do you realize that? I mean, they're, they're like, hey, you know, uh, they just tell us all kinds of things. And I think deliberately to get us upset, to get us angry, to cause division, to want us to fight one, against one another, to want to stir up trouble, that's what, the, that's what the enemy does. Now, 
as followers of Christ, though, what should we do? Well, we need to learn from David that whatever chapter we are in in life, whatever circumstances we're in, we need to seek the Lord first, right? We need to pray. It's important for us to live circumspectly as we go through life because God doesn't want you to go through life just haphazardly, right? And in fact, it tells us in Ephesians 5, 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, and the opposite of that, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so God wants us to be wise. He doesn't want any of us to be foolish. He doesn't want us to make foolish decisions in our relationships, in our financial decisions, in our spiritual decisions, in our whatever it is. He doesn't want you to be foolish. He doesn't want you to make foolish decisions. And as you study Proverbs, it's such a great insight about how God wants us to have wisdom. And so when he says you need to walk circumspectly, the idea is uh, specifically and accurately, right? And so in other words, we're to diligently, specifically examine with exactness the way that we live life, right? And when you do that, how do you do that? Well, you pray and you seek God, right? And, and, And when you pray about your marriage or about raising your children or, or about your spiritual relationship with God or your spiritual development, whatever it is, uh, God wants you to pray and he wants to give you insight. He knows everything about you, right? And he knows what you need. And, and David understands that because David knows that God is the answer to whatever the question is, right? And, you know, as our world gets darker and darker, there are people who need to hear the truth and they want to meet people who have a peace that passes understanding. They want to see people who are not all wound up about whatever it is that the media is winding us up about. No water in the lake, no wake surfing. Ah! I mean, it's like, I'm thinking they're liars. There's, there's going to be water, right? So, but here's the thing. God wants us to be a light. He wants us to bring joy and peace and love. And Jesus said in Luke 10 too, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So it's important for us to recognize God has a plan for our life. He doesn't want us to foolishly bump around, wasting our time, wasting our life, making stupid decisions. He wants us to be wise. He wants us to be a blessing to the people around us. Now, how do you know what the Lord wants you to do? We have to pray, like David does. And you have to say, Lord, what do you want me to be involved with as it relates to your spiritual life? Lord, how do you want me to be involved in church, right? And what are my spiritual gifts? Or how do, what do you want me to do at work? Or What do you want me to do with this or that or whatever it is that we want to pray and say, Lord, what's your direction in this thing? So David, as it says in verse 1, and the Lord said to him, go up. And David said, well, where am I going to go? And he said, go to Hebron. Now, I love this because as David specifically prays and says, what town should I go to? God tells him to go to Hebron. Now, Hebron is a place where, you know, many people uh, in the history of Israel had gone before. And Hebron means to fellowship with. It means to have communion with. So God says, Go to this town that the name means to have fellowship with, right? Remember when Abraham came to Hebron, and it says that Abraham there built an altar in Hebron to worship the Lord and fellowship with the Lord. So what is, David seeks God, and what does God tell him? Hey, you need to go to Hebron. You need to go to that place where we can have fellowship and, and commune together, and God can comfort you and direct you and guide you. And, you know, ever since Adam and Eve fell in the garden, the emphasis of the Bible is God bringing man into that right place fellowship with God and so that we can have that peace, that, that comfort, to know that he knows the future. He has things in control. And, and that's why Jesus came, was to forgive us our sins, that we could become born again, spiritually alive, that we can have spiritual life, that we can be a whole triune being, body, soul, spirit. And as David begins this new chapter in his life, God tells him, go to Hebron, the place of fellowship. And I think for all of us, when we think about what do we need more of in our lives, it, it, it's not whatever the world tells us you need more of, more hair product, more whatever it is, <laughs> bigger TV, bigger car, bigger house, whatever, more of this or more of that. Really, w- what we need is more fellowship with God because that's a thing that seems so difficult for us to do. You know, I talk to lots of spiritual leaders, people who are involved in ministry, pastors. You know what the number one difficult thing that I find people tell me is to do? is to spend time alone fellowshipping with God. For some people, it's difficult to even come to church. I mean, this is awesome. I love to come to church, and this is a way that we worship together and fellowship together, but just being alone with God. And God says, David, I want you to come to Hebron. In verse 3, it says, David brought up the men who were with him, every man and his household, and so they dwelt in the city 
cities of Hebron. Now, I love this because David brings his family, he brings his men and their families. Why? Because they're going to be blessed, right? Now, if you were here last week, David was not praying, not seeking God, and his family suffered. Now, David is praying, seeking God, and now David is going to be uh, the greatest blessing that he's ever been to his family, to his men, to the people around them. Why? Because he was seeking God for specific direction, where to go, how to go, when to go. And as he did that, his life becomes a blessing to everyone around him. And as our society begins a new chapter, and, and really, uh, I don't know if you recognize, but, but there are times of change, you know. I mean, in the 60s, I mean, I wasn't very old back then, but, you know, there was a time of change. Everybody wore tie-dye, bell-bottoms, and long hair, and did LSD, right? I mean, we're kind of past that now. Uh, and now what are we doing? Well, now, uh, you know, we have morality being defined by immoral people, <laughs> right? This is the blind leading the blind and, and telling us how to do it. We are just coming to a place where things are changing. And, and, and you might think, well, what should I do? Uh, you know, what, 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 how should I see this situation? Well, it's just a new chapter in life. And, and every country has chapters as they go through the history. I mean, and, and our country is moving in a direction. And, and as our society changes, what do I need to do? Well, I need to be like David. I need to pray and say, Lord, what should I do? See, because for David, Saul was trying to kill him. And he was the leader. He was the president of their country, basically, the king. And he was trying to kill David. And what did David do? Did he organize a group, a hit squad, to go out and kill the king? He did not. In fact, he had opportunities to kill him. And did he? No. And, and so what did David do? He just prayed and said, God, what do you want me to do? And he sought the Lord. And, and as David sought the Lord, God directed him. And we're going to see he's moving out of those chapters where things were difficult, and, and he's moving into some chapters where he is going to bless everyone around him. And I think it's important for us to understand that waiting is part of that. You know, we don't like to wait as Americans. We are impatient people. And if you drive a car, you get behind somebody. If you're at a stoplight or a stop sign and you wait for one millisecond to go, the guy behind you is on the horn, Meh! go, buddy, I'm in a hurry. Where are you going? I'm going home to watch The Price is Right. Anyway, but I mean, we're in a hurry. I mean, it's just, I don't watch The Price is Right, but I mean, I don't know where everybody's going. Well, yeah, well, you're like, well, that's not right. I mean, here, people aren't in a hurry to go anywhere. But I mean, we, we don't like to wait, though. We go to restaurants, whatever. You see people getting upset, whatever. But we need to spend time fellowshipping with the Lord because he will help us to understand that he is in control, right? And we need to be praying and seeking the Lord for direction, how to navigate wherever you're at in life. Because the world says, oh, the next chapter is going to be awesome. When you're in junior high, oh, I'm going to get in high school. Woo! You get in high school, oh, right? And then you're a single person. Oh, if I could just get married. You get married, you're like, oh, you know, and then, right? I mean, and then you work and you're working. You're like, oh, this is a terrible chapter. Oh, I'm going to get to retirement. Oh, get retirement. My dad tells me, hey, these golden years aren't so golden. I just go to the doctor and repair my camper and, you know, whatever. But but at every stage, we think it's always going to be better. God wants you to enjoy whatever chapter you're in right now, right? Wherever you're at, don't look and say, oh, one day. See, David was able to spend time with the Lord, and God encouraged him and gave him peace in the midst of difficult times. I love Proverbs 3, 5, where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. If you don't have that verse written down, you should write it down. I have it a plaque in my office, somebody bought me. And I love it, that God wants to direct you. And that's part of the normal life. Now, here's the part we don't like. Someone came to me years ago and said, Pastor Bob, you said last week or a month ago that I needed to pray about this thing. And he said, I've been praying about it now for three days and nothing has happened. I'm like, well, three days isn't that long. It's long to me. I'm like, well, it might be long to you, but it's not that long, right? I mean, that we don't want to wait. Sometimes we pray and God is going to say, yes, no, or wait. Now, I don't know about you, but when I study the Bible, I see that he says wait for people a lot, <laughs> right? We don't like that, but it's part of it. And so you might as well enjoy it, right? And, and, and so David here, you know, he's praying, and in verse 4 it says, Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. So as David is praying and seeking God and waiting, what's going to happen in this next chapter of his life? As David seeks to obey God and makes fellowshipping with God the top priority as he comes to Hebron, and what happens? The men of Judah come and anoint David as king. He doesn't have to do it himself. He doesn't have to toot his own horn. He doesn't have to promote himself. That's what Saul did, right? David just seeks the Lord and continues to wait. Now, 
There's nothing wrong with being proactive, and God wants us to be wise, but there are times when God tells us to wait. And as David is praying and saying, where should I go? What town? What should I do? And then he just, he's in Hebron, and there he's just fellowshipping with the Lord and just trusting and waiting for what God's going to do next. And that's so important for us because sometimes when we don't want to wait, we like Abraham, we're like, oh, well, let's get this other wife, and then let's get, oh, let's have a child from him. Oh, and that'll, you know, if you know history, I mean, that was not good, right? But David, he just waits. And, and, and that's really important for us when we're praying and we're seeking God, that if he doesn't give us some clear direction, then we should keep praying, right? David doesn't say, I'm the king now, people, right? He just prays, fellowships with God. And Jesus said it like this in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I love that verse, right? That, that as Christians, if you seek God and you put God first in your life and you seek to fellowship with him and get divine direction from him, daily direction from him, then everything else is going to work out, right? I mean, I want you, the next time you have some Christian say to you, oh, everything's chaotic, I want you to say to him, do you put God first? Do you get up in the morning and pray and say, Lord, I want to spend time with you because I know you have the answers. You know the future. Lord, you direct me. Did you get to where you are because of that? (laughs) Now, for David, there were times when he was seeking God and things were crazy, but there were times when it was somebody else's fault. So David prays. He says to God, what should I do? God says, go to Hebron. David obeys God, goes to Hebron. And then as David is there fellowship with God, God then brings these men to anoint him as king over Judah. And I I love that. And, you know, and what's the result of David praying, seeking God? All the people around him are blessed, right? There's just this blessing that comes from being around him. And whenever we enter into a new chapter of life, we need to humble ourselves and, and seek God for specific direction. Even though it might seem obvious, well, I won the lottery. I'm going to buy a new Ferrari or whatever. We need to seek God. God, how do you want me to use this money? What? Give it to the church? How much? Right? Okay. You're like, Pastor Bob, that's not going to happen. That was just, <laughs> right? But here's the thing. It says in verse 1, it happened after this. There was a lot of waiting, 15 years, and then David inquired of the Lord. 15 years. And, and now, as he gets to Hebron, he still was waiting, right? And then what happened? As he seeks the Lord, puts him first, everything else is added to him. They come and give him. Now, is it over? Nope. Is there more waiting? Yep. My wife said, how did they like it last night? You tell them about waiting. Like, they don't like it. <laughs> how are you liking it now? They don't like it, right? But here's the thing. You might as well understand it because it's part of life right? Waiting is part of life. Seeking the Lord. And David waits. They, can't, they anoint him as king. And remember, uh, David didn't give up, though. That's so important. Remember when Joseph, God said, look, your family's going to bow down to you. How many years was it, or how many days was it before Joseph became second in charge of Egypt and everybody bowed down to him? It wasn't days. It was 13 years, right? 13 years. And remember, he got sold into slavery and then Potiphar's house, all of that stuff. Remember, God told Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have a son. And the Messiah is going to come through you, and I'm going to make a great nation of you. And how long did Abraham have to wait before he got a child? 25 years. Raise your hand if you've been praying for something for 25 years. Right, two of you. <laughs> right. I mean, we just don't think that way as Americans. We want things right now, right? And, but, but the truth is, Abraham in Hebrews 6, 15, it says, after he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. See, part of experiencing God's best in your life and experiencing those things in your life that, that God wants to do that are amazing is that we need to patiently endure, that we need to wait. We need to pray. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I want to encourage you today, if you've been waiting for something, don't grow weary. Don't give up. Don't quit. We're going to see in the next weeks of David's life, in these chapters we're going to read, that, man, God does great things in David's life. He had to wait, yes, but, but that was because God was preparing him God was preparing the other people around him. And in your life, if you're still waiting for something, you need to know that God's preparing. Maybe you're waiting for a wife. Well, God's preparing her, right? And maybe you're waiting for some financial change. Well, God, he's preparing things, right? And you, you don't know what God's doing, but God is always on your side. He loves you, and he encourages us, don't give up. In Galatians 6, 9, it says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So many Christians miss out on the great things that God has for them because they give up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Know that praying and seeking and waiting is part of the process. And you know what it does to us when we wait and pray? It teaches us patience. And that is a great attribute to have in your life. You know, I love kids, and I thought I was kind of patient until I had twins and had three boys. And then it was like, whoa, and, and it changed my life. <laughs> 
I am a different person now after going through the trials of having three boys. And, you know, the most important thing is that I'm more loving, but I'm more patient. And I think those things go together. Being loving and being patient and being gracious with people come through learning those things that God can only teach us through those difficult times. And we want to skip it, but you know what? You can't skip it. It's part of life. It's how God shapes us. We all want to be holy and pure, but trials are the mechanism by which God transforms us and changes us sometimes. Because some of you are stubborn. (laughs) No. Some of you are hard-headed, right? Me. I mean, I'm that way. God had to do crazy things in my life to transform me, and I'm thankful for it, right? I didn't always like waiting. I don't like waiting now. I am very much like you. I don't want to wait, but I recognize it's just, it's the way it is. And so I want to seek the Lord for specific direction, and I want to go when he says go, wait when he says wait, and you know what it does? It produces a great life for you, and it produces a great life for those around you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, we are so blessed that you love us, that you know everything about us. You know the future. You know the number of hairs on our head. And Lord, so help us to put our trust and faith in you alone. Lord, that we would seek you and that we would recognize, Lord, that whatever chapter in life that we're in, Lord, we need you. We need to fellowship with you and commune with you and spend time with you, being led by you, Lord, because you want to do great things in our lives. And so we thank you for your word today. We pray you would cause these truths to transform our minds and hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.